So here I am, young guy in this neighborhood. I didn't know anybody. It had about 1,500 rooftops. It had a very defined geographic area. Uh, it was a gated community. And um, it wasn't really my primary place that I was selling real estate. I was actually selling in Richmond, Indiana, which is about 15 minutes away. And essentially what happened was as I started getting involved in the community, I figured out real quickly that nobody was going to trust me as a young guy to do anything there. They didn't know me, number one. It was kind of a, a rural community. Number two, um, you know, with my age, it kind of hurt me. So my strategy was to just help as many people as I could, be involved in as many things as I could, make enough deposits in those people's lives there that in return, when they thought about real estate, you know, they would think of me and at least give me an at bat. And that's exactly what happened. So immediately I went out and bought the domain of lockandgrin.com, which was, you know, the name of the neighborhood. And this is of course when the internet was just kind of coming into uh, usefulness for realtors. So I was able to get that domain. I was also able to create a lot of marketing to rebrand the community. Whereas before it was kind of older, you know, it had been there for 30 years, 40 years, and the, the, all the logos were old. Everything was just old about it. So I basically set out and rebranded the community with my own stuff. You know, at that time, it was aero photography, new logos. We actually even later created a theme song for the community. I mean, just kind of really tried to make it a vibrant feel. And then, of course, I owned all that intellectual rights. So only I was able to use the marketing that we were building for the community, but it was really owned by me. So it was a really unique situation that, um, that taught me a lot of lessons in doing it when we started replicating it in other communities. Um, hey, so hey, as we hang moved on, along, hang on, yeah. hang on yeah. one second. There's a lot of people that yeah. just joined us. Uh, so this is Andrew okay. Gaydosh. He's uh, going to be speaking to you guys about the neighborhood mayor Paul uh, business that he has developed over a number of years. And we're just getting started. So Andrew's going ahead. Here we go. Yeah, no worries, guys. And sorry, I'm in a in a uh, lobby in uh, in Cleveland for Al Stasek's big event he's doing tomorrow. So we just rolled in tonight. So hopefully you can hear me okay. Um, so here I am. I'm in this community. I don't know anybody. Uh, you know, I didn't have really. I I bought one house in my life. I really not sold a lot of houses yet. All I knew is that this particular community did not have a dominant real estate person. It was somewhat secluded, and I felt like I could add some value to it. So by rebranding the community, creating logos, creating all that stuff, at that point, it gave me the opportunity to kind of be the go-to person. If anybody was looking for any information in the community, they would come to me. They would come to lockandgrin.com. I actually hired several of the older folks that were in the neighborhood to write a history of Lock and Grin. Uh, you know, the people that had been there from day one, you know, I paid them 10 bucks an hour. They all got together. It was like a six month project and they actually created this history so that we as newbies even knew what it was. And of course we own that. So we put it on our website. So we had all this content back in the day before we knew what content was and really provided that for anybody that was coming into the community. They were looking at that content and then associating it with me. So I was associated with as an expert in that community. And it really turned out to benefit me in that a lot of people really didn't have a vested interest in the community as far as other realtors, they were just there to buy and sell a few houses where I was in it for the long haul saying, hey, listen, I'm gonna do whatever it takes to raise the bar three or four times higher than anybody could think of. And then in return, I'm gonna milk this relationship for as long as I can be here. That's kind of the idea. Um, so for you guys that are out there looking at, well, let me just finish up real quick and where it ended up. So we've been at, roughly about 75 percent market share in the community for 25 plus years on the waterfront which consists of about 240 homes we've had a hundred percent market share of the waterfront for about that length of time as well meaning that we were one of we were on one side of each transaction unless it was a personal family transaction um, it's gone pretty big whereas we're huge, throwing huge fireworks presentations you know spending forty thousand dollars a year to to create a party for the community and all that stuff. That all happened as we grew, but the little baby steps kind of got us there. But why I tell you the end of the story is that the, the lessons learned are, if you're looking at 
developing a farm area, you're looking at growing your own brand, and you're looking at becoming a listing magnet, you really want to hyper focus on something. Now, Kitchens always says the riches are in the niches, and it's very much the truth. Um, in this situation, we went all in. We doubled down on one specific area. What made this community unique and what I teach our students now is you want to, A, you want to identify a neighborhood that has certain characteristics. Or when I say neighborhood, I'm not talking only about a geographic area. You could be talking about an organization. It could be talking about a church. You could be talking about a group of people that may get together. But in this case, I still think geographic neighborhoods work the best. But if you can identify an area that's somewhat identifiable, meaning that it's secluded enough or it's known enough to say, hey, I live in the Reefston area, that there is a defined border to where the Reefston area is, or I live at five points. Okay, well, five points is a specific area because you can't be a specialist in an area that's not defined, if that makes sense. So if you could get into, so you identify an area, once you identify that, make sure that you brand it with your own branding so that you have free rights to use whatever you've branded in that area. Um, so you're not having to go ask the community or the HOA. Uh, you're not having to ask for any permission because we don't like to ask for permission. We just like to get it done. Um, so once you identify the community, you're able to brand it. Then the second thing is part of that identification of the community is you want to find an area that has a turnover. There's got to be velocity in the sales. There are so many neighborhoods that we all know that we've been involved in that hell, they just sold out maybe 10 years ago. And you, meaning that they were finished 10 years ago, people are going to live there for the life cycle of their children. They're probably not going to move for another 10 years, 15 years. So there's not a lot of turnover in those areas or the areas that are a little bit more mature. And you have a lot of people that are in their, you know, mid 50s, 60s that are going to be there until they're 70 or 80, not a lot of turnover. Those aren't areas that you want to go spend your dollars in. You want to spend dollars in the, in the areas that are turning over. So you do the, do the map, find out how many homes sold in the area last year, find out what the time it took to sell those homes, meaning that they didn't stay on the market for a year, so you're not going broke trying to get them sold. So you have to have at least a number of homes that are available to be sold, a number of homes that do turn over, and you want them to sell quickly. So if you look at all those different key performance indicators, you're going to find out, hey, listen, this is the right neighborhood. This is the one I want to be in. Once that happens, you double down on it. And, um, oh, the other thing is you probably don't want to go into a neighborhood that has uh, a, somebody that totally dominates it. So if somebody's already there and they're already doing 15, 20 percent in a neighborhood, I mean, that is like the gorilla in the market. It's tough to compete if one or two out of every sign, every five signs you see has, you know, Andrew Gadosh's name and face on it, it's going to be kind of hard to compete against that if I'm a new to that area or if I'm running fle uh, fresh marketing dollars towards it. Andrew, so what's, your, what's your advice yeah. to everybody on that point to determine the uh, who has the market share? Well, I think you just got to do the math. So run the numbers in the, um, in the MLS and find out for sure, you know, hey, if there's anybody, I mean, you know, if there's 100 homes sold there last year, and there's one agent that sold 20 of them, then, okay, that's starting to get to the point where they're going to be a contender. Now, every Batman has a Robin, right? So there is always room for second place in hopes that they're going to become first place. But if you have one or two people that are already dominating the area, you kind of want to be a little cautious, unless you live right there, and that's one of the few options that you have. Um, I like to see neighborhoods that have at least 1,500 rooftops. Um, that's kind of like a good number when you're doing mass mailings. Uh, mailings that you can use for every door direct because it's cheaper. And at that point, then, you know, you're, you're using um, a good, a, a, you've got a decent enough uh, marketing piece that when you're producing a piece and you have your people touching it, that it's going to cover enough people to, to lower cost the average. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Any other questions before I keep going? I don't want to like keep yeah. rambling if you guys have anything. Hang on, hang on a second. What? You mentioned every door direct. We found that to be the best. Yeah, so we're a huge proponent of kind of land, air, and sea, like shock and awe. So we're going to hit them with mailings, 
um, the mailings I love are the postcards because I can send a lot of them out cheap with every door direct. And for those of you that don't know what that is, that's basically where you bundle a packet of postcards, you give them to the post office, and they basically just stuff every deliver every person on the delivery route. And it's a fraction of the cost of hand delivering or of them hand delivering or stamping each mail piece. Um, so mail is a huge deal. We also, uh, you know, internet, we talked a little bit about the websites. Um, we create websites in our communities that look like the official community website. And, you know, <clears throat> sometimes HOAs have a little bit of a hard time and they'll give you a little bit of trouble with that. So you have to tweak it to make it, hey, I'm not the official HOA, but legally they can't stop you. You own your own, you know, logo to it. You're, you live in the community, you can promote it the way you want. But the goal is you want to create a website that gives the uh, idea or the uh, creates the image that you are the official uh, person to come to when they want to find out information about that specific area. You're the expert. And on that website, it's very clean. You've got community information. You've got a community map. I like to have interactive maps. Um, within that map, they can click on a point. And they'll see images from what it looks like in that community. For example, if you're in a neighborhood and, hey, this is West Park Playground, click on the West Park Playground and there's a tour of West Park, you know, video. Um, strategically, you're going to want to place your own vehicles, your own, um, you know, while you're doing your videos, your own uh, product placement on your shirts. You want to kind of strategically put your product placement in the background. Like we've got several wrap vehicles, so they're often in the background, just kind of very subtle. Uh, again, when people are looking at the community, it's like, oh, that Andrew, he knows what's up. He's in these, he's in these photos. You want to watermark your, your photos so that nobody else can use them. And um, so you've got basically mailers that go out. You've got the websites that look like the official HOA sites. And then the most effective thing you can do, and this is, this is definitely what, what Al Stasek would say, kind of a pro tip. You want to create your own community private Facebook group for that community. Now, ours are all called Yankee Trace Community Group. I'm sorry, Yankee Trace Neighborhood Group, Lake Lock and Grin Neighborhood Group. Wherever we're at, it's the neighborhood group. And within that, everything that we do from a marketing piece is driving people to become a member of that community group. So, for example, we just had a meeting this morning and we're talking about our Halloween functions. We just finished our big golf outing last week. Now we're on to the next event. Every event you do, you're promoting the next event at your current one. So now, uh, you know, Halloween's coming up. So we're going to put out what we call boo baskets, which is one of the cheapest, easiest things that you can do. I love the boo basket promotion because when they get a boo basket on their front door, and for those of you who don't know, don't know what a boo basket is, that's basically just like a little plastic uh, jack-o'-lantern uh, bucket filled with toys and filled with candy and maybe a couple beers or a bottle of wine for the parents. And we put about 15 to 20 of them out throughout the community with instructions. When people have been booed, they take the contents of what's in there. They read the poem that's talking about the ghouls and goblins that are in the community. It's really kind of well-crafted. And then there's instructions on to put a, uh, a sign on their door that says they've been booed so they don't get booed again. But then the key is on the back page, it says, Hey, you know, thank you for participating in this. Um, make sure that you take a picture of you enjoying your treats and post them to the Yankee Trace, uh, you know, neighborhood group with your picture. So what's happening is people are saying, okay, well, what, what's this all about? I need to join this group. So now we're driving more traffic to that group. Once you, the people that are in the group are seeing their neighbors, having a good time with this whole promotion, it brings the community together. It's just a fun thing that you can do. But back to the, back to the, neighborhood groups, that's basically your private neighborhood media album. You own it. You don't let any other realtors on it. Um, you promote yourself the way you want. Everything you do becomes part of that group in terms of every time you're taking a walk with your wife or your spouse and you're, you see a, something that's worth of talking about, you jump on there. Hey, it's Andrew. Check out this really cool turtle I saw in, in the pond or look at the kids playing. You know, you're, it's your own visible group that you're allowing the rest of the community to uh, participate in. They can post and they do a lot of good things and they really drive 90% of the content. But 
everything you do from your business is promoted in that group that's related to that neighborhood. And it really works out well. So the promotion leading up to each event is on the private Facebook group leading up to it. The postcard goes out three or four weeks in advance, sending people to the private Facebook group for more information on the details. You give them a little bit of a thousand foot view on the postcard, but they got to go to the group to find out the details. Once the, the event happens, we're doing a Facebook live. We're interviewing people. We're talking about how much fun the event is. And then three weeks later after the event or the week after, we're doing a thank you post to the sponsors, to the people that are on there. So that all is the media outlet to capture the event, which is the content, which then in return is the source for why we would even send out a postcard in the first place. So there's three main parts to kind of triangulate that and each one needs to be individual. Uh, you need each individual part of it to make the ecosystem kind of work, if that makes sense. Yep. Michael, you have any questions about how that works? Well, so no, but I, I do want to ask, um, one of the things that impressed me about your, your presentation back in 19, if I can remember, it must have been impressive. That's a long time to get for me. But you talked about how you had to make the investment up front, that you had to be committed to that con concept. And I remember your story about the first fireworks show. Can you just share that in relation to having the gut? Sure. Yeah, no, I love it. That's good stuff. Um, you know, basically, you're gonna basically you're gonna start. You're gonna give before you get, and you're all starting in an area that you probably don't have more than five, ten percent market share already. So it's an interesting deal, and it's just like anything in life. And you probably do a lot of this yourself right now, but you have to give before you get, right? You don't walk into a listing appointment and say, here, sign here. I want to take the commission. You have to give them information. You have to provide them value. You have to do what's um, what they need in order to, uh, to you know, kind of think of you as a trusted advisor. And that's a real big deal when you start getting into that. So I feel like, you know, with the story that he talks about, I, here I was young, not really uh, well connected in the community. Um, people weren't taking me serious. I didn't have the money to do the big stuff yet. So I just tried to do the little things, the things that didn't cost a lot of money. And I also tried to hijack um, the other things that were going on in the community. I don't know, am I still on here? Am I the only one or did, you, did we lose everybody else? Somebody send me, uh, send me something in the chat if I'm still live here. Any comments? Looks like I am. I'm going to keep rolling. So basically where we're at with this is that with the fireworks, I essentially had a, um, a situation where I couldn't sweet. Okay, good. Still here. Um, I couldn't really afford to do the fireworks fireworks at the time were about a fifteen thousand dollar project here i was i'd sold about five or six houses in the community pretty consistent i was probably at about three to five percent market share people knew who i was but they didn't really i didn't really differentiate myself from anybody else at that point at the moment where i went all in and i went big and i set the bar higher than anybody else really would want to do was at the point where my phone started ringing and to the point where you're turning away the listing opportunities because you know they're not going to sell and you're like, hey, I'm sorry, I can't help you out, but at least they're calling you. So what I did was I went to the bank. I have a credit line. Uh, I had a credit line at the time. I was using it to buy and sell houses and I basically pulled 15 grand out and I said, I'm going all in. We put on this awesome fireworks show at the dam overlooking the lake. We promoted the hell out of it. I got five different sponsors to kick in. I think at the time it was like a thousand dollars, and the whole you know the whole project was about a twenty thousand dollar budget. Five thousand for the promotion, a couple thousand for um, the miscellaneous stuff, the you know things that were you know the porta potties, all that kind of stuff, and then about a thirteen thousand dollar show itself. When that happened, and people saw what we were doing for the community it blew us up. It also showed that we were a sign of success, that we had the means to do it, number one, that we had the relationships to do it, 
And thirdly, that we were committed to doing something great for the community. And I think that's really, really important thing. One of our core values on our team is to give before you get, you know, make deposits in people's lives. If you help enough people get what they want, you're going to get what you want. And I feel like that was a big turning point for me. And at that point, we started looking at, okay, what else can we do that's over the top in this neighborhood? One of them was uh, I was at Putin Bay, which I'll be going to on Friday with Al and the rest of the Honey Badgers. Um, it's a small island right off the coast of, uh, of Cleveland here. And um, hey, you made it back, Michael. I'm, I've been listening. <laughs> All right, good. Um, so a small island. Um, and I was there at Putin Bay and I heard this really cool, catchy song. And I was like, man, I could rewrite the lyrics to that. And we could use that for locking them to sell the dream. Well, what happened was I was able to finally get a hold of the artists that, and they were reluctant to do it. They didn't want their song that they're very proud of, you know, kind of being turned around and some realtor from Southern Indiana uh, or Southern Ohio writing it. But over time we negotiated, I bought the rights to distribute it only for marketing purposes, only in a small a geographic area. And they basically perform the song again. And now it's the Lock and Grin theme song. What's pretty cool is after like, I don't know, it was a couple months after we kind of started putting it out there on our websites and everywhere, the Garden Club, which consists of lots of the retired people in the community. And they said, hey, Andrew, you know, we've got we, we need the lyrics to your song. We want to print them out. And we want to sing it or sing the song when we start our next Garden Club meeting. <laughs> we want to sing the <laughs> official Lock and Grin theme song. And I about, you know, I was just laughing because it it truly you don't realize the impact you're making. And that strategically was just setting the bar pretty high that, you know, the average realtor is not going to do that. So now our entire no, he, strategy in that community is to do something major every quarter and to have some type of event every month. And if we do that consistently, we've been able to maintain that market share. Now the lessons learned are, okay, so we, we kind of went through this, this all kind of happened organically we started documenting what we did because we recognized there's a reason why we were making quantum leaps in the community to gain market share. <laughs> What's up, baby? Come here. Here's a honey badger, Mr. Al Stasek. What's up, What's up Adam? How you doing, brother? <laughs> Can't hear you, but hey, he said hi. I'll see you guys in a little bit. Um, so basically, uh, what what we tried to do, or what we realized when we tried to replicate it in other areas, is that we learned real quick what worked, what was scalable, and what wasn't scalable. And I feel like now we've been able to do that in about six different neighborhoods, and um, it's worked out very well, and we've got some lessons learned that, that, that we've uh, kind of learned the hard way that hopefully you guys don't have to learn. Uh, the first thing is don't get discouraged. It takes time. I mean, this is not a quick six-month deal. This is a one- to two-year burn. You're going to be able to sustain what you're spending hopefully within the first six months you're not going to really make a lot of money for another year until that first year year and a half hits and then the floodgates open and it will bring you back tenfold the investment that you make the key there is that you can start in a community doing the things that don't cost a lot of money the same things that i was doing initially having a cookout at the house going to the garden club, asking them, what, what can I do to help them? Um, you know, the Bass Club in this particular neighborhood in, in um, Lockengren, we I think we spent $300 and bought feeder fish for them to help stock the lake. I mean, little things that don't break the bank, but are really making an impact on people that they appreciate. Door knocking, being at every event, kissing babies, shaking hands, doing the things that you would want somebody to do to you because it, to be a good neighbor, to, to have good neighbors, you have to be a good neighbor. It's the same thing. You're just being a good neighbor to the entire community. So those are the things you can do in your new neighborhood. Don't get discouraged, but have a plan. Lay it out. Every month you're going to do at least something. Pull your resources from your friends and family that live in the neighborhood. Like I said, you don't have to underwrite the whole thing. You could be the one that you know uh, basically puts on the cookout that doesn't mean you have to buy the meat bring all the sides and everything else you just have to organize it hey jim can you can you bring some hamburgers down we're having a cookout we expect 50 people 
you know, can you bring some chips? Can you do that? Everybody loves it. The fact that somebody else is doing the dirty work or the hard work and organizing it, you're going to be the star. And of course, go to your vendors, go to the people that rely on you for business and just ask them, Hey, listen, I've got an opportunity for you to help share in the community some expenses to acquire clients for us for next year. Would you be willing to underwrite the meat for our big cook-off we're doing? Well, heck yeah. Can you come by and shake hands and kiss some babies with me? You know, make sure you wear, wear your gear. Put their sign up. Put a banner up around, you know, on the other side of the tent. You know, give them the love so that they know that they're investing in you. You're investing in them. So as doing that, you're going to learn things that work, things that aren't going to work. But you got to stick with it because it is a long-term process and it's a long burn. And, and Andrew, um, when when you say just give me a, a like a, a little quick menu of four or five of the things you do on a monthly basis, uh, I mean the big event was the fireworks. You talked about the cookouts. What are some of the other things you do on a monthly basis? Sure. So each neighborhood's a little different. You have to tailor it for what neighborhood you're in. Uh, when we're around the lake, we do things like um, you know. Nine, a nine hole, for example, that would be something that we do in May where we organize it. We have nine different stops on the lake. I asked nine of my past clients to open up their docks for us to all land on. There's about 400 people that show up. Each host will provide the dock. We provide volunteers to help do whatever is going to happen there. Maybe there's some snacks or some food. We don't serve any alcohol at those events for liability, but that's just kind of an idea of a pro progressive party that we do around the lake. At Yankee Trace, which is a golf community, we do a poker run, a golf cart poker run. Um, it's great. We're up to about, well, I think last the last time we did it, we had 50 uh, golf carts. There's not that many in the neighborhood. When, we, when I first brought mine in that I used at the lake, I brought it over to Yankee, which is another community that we do a lot of work in. And, you know, the only golf carts running on there were people on the golf course. Now, Everybody's got golf carts because they're they're taking them to their events and they're doing the golf cart rally and the poker runs. But to give you an idea, we start out in January. Uh, we do our boat shows and our um, some of our agents, some of the female agents do bridal shows. Um, we do any kind of home show, kind of convention type thing you can do because it's colder than hell in the Midwest and we really can't be outside. So we're doing at, at that time we're doing uh, our trade shows, promoting our communities within there. Um, in, uh, in the end of January, we do our uh, brew or blues fest, we call it, where we have a blues fest where let's shake off the winter blues. We usually partner with a local restaurant close to the community that we're, that we're marketing. We get sponsors to help out. And it's usually a Thursday night and you know, or Friday and everybody comes in from seven to 10 or 11. We give them a couple free drinks. It's a way to kind of shake off the winter blues and come see your friends if you haven't seen and let's have a party. February, we roll into um, our next event. And then, you know, it's like one after the other after the other. And there's always something that we can do that's going to be relevant. In February, typically we're doing uh, big college football or basketball parties. That's kind of our deal. Uh, I play for the Flyers and I have a connection with them. So I host a big event um, that we do in uh, at the UD Arena. And that's a cool deal. And I invite every one of the neighborhoods, every one of our agents on our team, we call them mini mayors, they invite all their people from their neighborhoods up to this big party that we do at the, at, in the flight deck, which is at the top of the ED arena. So those are kind of just little things to touch. Uh, we love holidays. So uh, St. Patrick's Day is one of our big events of the year. We'll have roughly about 500 people show up to our St. Patrick's Day party. And again, you don't have to carry the heavy lifting yourself. What we did is we went to a massive Irish pub that is in town they have the biggest event in the Midwest for uh, St. Patrick's Day. And we said, hey, can we basically rent our own tent and we bring in a 40 by 40 tent and we attach it to the main tent. And then we have a VIP section that we pay for everybody's tickets to get in. We uh, it's open bar. They pay. I'm sorry. It's it's cash bar. So they pay their own drinks. But we provide them an area in there. Well, that, again, serves really well for all the communities because we invite not only everybody in our our client appreciation party that's everywhere we've ever sold. But then we go drill down to our neighborhoods and say, Hey, Yankee trace, we're having our, you know, our, our St. Patrick's day party at the event, come by and share some time with your neighbors. They don't know that we invited everybody else in the database, but it's very targeted for them 
right. and it's on their local neighborhood, so they think it's event for them. Okay. Uh, like I said, each each month is something different. Fourth uh, of July or May rolls around. We have our nine hole event. We have some of that. Uh, July, it's our fireworks presentation uh, at the lake. We do the big fireworks show in Yankee Trace. We um, do a big event at the local parade. It's like a really big bicentennial parade that they do. We have the Hummer in there and a bunch of mini bikes and the golf carts and we act like Shriners and drive around and throw candy around and stuff like that. So there's always something you can do. It's just, you have to do something and you can't not do it. Um, another big thing we do is our charity. I'm a firm believer, just like what Al's doing here in Cleveland, he's adopted a charity that's close to his heart. I mean, he, he obviously believes in it and that's, you know, trafficking, human tra trafficking. So, it's easy to get behind something you believe in. He has a big event here in Cleveland, and uh, that's what we're doing tomorrow. What my event is, my wife and I had issues uh, having kids, and so fertility issues. And we did in vitro, hell, we did six in vitro to have our first, our first daughter. Well, that's important to us. So we do a huge event called the Birdies for Babies. And we invite, uh, usually we have a full field of golfers. We raise about $20,000 every year to help a couple in the community that's at their last leg and can't afford in vitro. And uh, thus far, we've had two babies born. We've done it three years in a row. The two babies came back this year. We just did it two weeks ago. You know, they were there giving everybody hugs. And, you know, it's a great it's a great thing to do. But, you you know, we believe in it. The neighborhood gets behind it. And what do you think your customers and your people think of you when you do things like that? Because it's like, I mean, that's not why we do it, but it does – give them a different side of you. They're, they're knowing you as the human, as somebody that's giving back, just not taking a commission. And I feel like that's really important to get behind some kind of cause that's dear to your heart and, and do it and go all in and have help with it. Um, so those are just kind of some of the things. The boo baskets are huge. If you're starting out, two of the gangster things that I think are the most effective for the money, Kona ice trucks. You guys have Kona ice probably around you. Yeah. Basically the first day of school, the last day of school, we throw a party for the kids in the local park right there in the neighborhood. Each neighborhood has its own little park that we do. Kona Ice Trucks comes in and costs us three, three, 400 bucks. The lender underwrites it and we're there shaking hands and, and having a good time. And the kids think it's the greatest thing in the world. The buses actually drop them off at the park now instead of their home. I mean, they literally get notes to get dropped off of the bus and it's just a big deal. Again, doesn't cost much money. Uh, we love that. The other thing is the... Um, See, that was the one. What was the other one I was going to say that, that's really, really good, that's inexpensive. Uh, can't think of it right now, but it's there's a, there's a couple. Oh, the Boo Baskets that we talked about earlier. The Boo Baskets will give you more notoriety in your neighborhood than anything you can do because what they stick on their door has a little logo. Uh, everything they read has your little subtle logo, and they're, they're going to your website, your private Facebook group to post it up. So it's just a really cool thing. It's inexpensive. And guess what? After you put the first 10 to 15 of them out there, they refill and they restock them and they pay it for them. And then they drop <laughs> them off at your, they drop them off your door when it's all said and done. Man. Pie giveaways for Thanksgiving. We crush it with the pie giveaways. That's another really cool thing. We start inviting people to our office for that. So they get to know us a little bit better and we have cocktails for them. So uh, it's just a really cool deal. Now there's three different levels of this. If you guys want to get into it at some point, you can reach out to me. Um, We've got our um, our mayor candidate, we call it. That's somebody that's not quite the mayor yet. That's somebody that is starting out. It doesn't have as, uh, they have more time than they have money, okay? So they're gonna do the things that don't cost a lot and we're gonna show you how to do that, how to partner with people. Uh, the first term mayor is somebody, when you're getting about 10 to 15% market share in a community, hey, they know you as the mayor, but you haven't proven yourself as long-term. Uh, you don't have the staying power. You don't have that legacy. Hey, my daughter used you and I'm going to use you too. Um, and then the last, and so there you're starting to spend a little bit more money. You're getting a little bit more aggressive. You're doing more events. And then the last one is your, um, is your incumbent mayor. That's somebody that's been around for a while. You know, you've got 20 plus market share. You're crushing it. People are seeing you as the community leader. You're, you're rolling up all your other neighborhoods into major events that you're doing uh, for your own business and rolling those into it. And it's, it's kind of a, a, a different strategy that you're going to use for those people than you would when you're first starting out. So, Andrew, there's a couple of questions that have come up in the chat. Yeah. Um, the first one from uh, Kamala is, 
what if you don't have anyone that you don't know anybody in the neighborhood that you want to target? What, how do you how do you start? Sure. Yeah. Um, great question. So, so what kind of happened to me is I didn't know a soul. Um, I literally got out on the boat. I saw a flotilla of about 16 pontoons tied up and I just kind of rolled in and said, Hey, I'm Andrew. I'm new to the neighborhood. How you doing? You know what I mean? I know it was really uncomfortable. I may have had a couple of drinks before I did it. So I, maybe I wasn't quite so uncomfortable at 24 years old, but um, I met some friends that have become friends for life just by putting myself out there. So I think to answer your question, you have to put yourself out there, go volunteer in some of the HOA organization stuff. Don't get political. Don't sit on the board. We have to make decisions. Go and only put yourself into positions where you're contributing non-controversial uh, things because any HOA or most HOAs have a lot of controversial topics. Some people want something, some people don't. You do it long enough, you're going to make enough enemies. Be very politically neutral and volunteer. Uh, go to these organizations. Hey, you know, um, you know, the Christmas Lights Committee, they've got a Christmas Lights Committee in one of the neighborhoods where they decorate you know, the entries to the neighborhood. Hey, what can I do to help you guys out? You guys need more effort. You know, maybe you're uh, a mayor candidate. You're going to go out there and freeze your tail off and put up some lights with them. You're going to volunteer with them. Uh, maybe when you're an incumbent, you're buying the lights and saying, hey, I'm donating this number of lights this year. But um, get yourself into a position where you're having interactions with people. And again, make a deposit in their lives. Identify what they need. And if you can't figure it out, just ask them. They'll be happy to tell you. Great, thanks. And then another question from uh, Kristen was, what do you put on your mailers? Like, what what are the the format of the mailers? Is, it, is there anything you do that makes it really stand out? Or, um, you know, it's a. Uh, let me see here. If I could, I'm gonna try to pull. I might be able to pull something. If I can, do I have access to share my screen? You're way over my pay grade, brother. Okay. Let me look here. Let me see if I can pull this up real quick. Picture in picture. The what? The three dots on his picture. All right. No. No. You, no. Don't cut them off. Okay. I got a lot of people that have a lot of confidence in me. <laughs> okay, that's all right. No, no problem. You, you know so, what, Ant, just, just sh shoot me something and I'll share it with the group. Yeah, so I'll tell you what we'll do. Um, I can give it, if anybody wants to join the Neighborhood Mayor group, uh, it's a private Facebook group, just go to Neighborhood Mayors uh, on Facebook. And we do have some marketing stuff that we put in there. Um, you know, we could kind of share some of that with you. But basically what we do is, again, our postcards always have our tagline, giving back to the community. That's kind of a, a tagline that we use. It always has my face. It's not obnoxious where I'm the, the focal point. I'm just identifiable, right? You don't want to, this doesn't want to be about you, but you need to be subtle, but present. Um, and then in the postcard, the first, the front of it typically is based around the event that we're trying to promote. And in that event, it's going to have a picture, for example, the boo baskets or kids holding, you know, going trick or treating, holding the boo baskets. And, and, you know, it'll say the boo baskets will be arriving soon. You know, take a look at uh, the, the Yankee Trace neighborhood group for details. This is what it is. And we push people to that. On the back, it's just me on the left hand side, giving back to the community. And on the right hand side will be the postal address and all that. So it's really simple. Again, you're just hitting them. You're hitting them over and over and over. You don't want to be obnoxious about it, but at the same time, you want to be present. Right. And, you know, we do Easter cards. We do, um, you know, the birdies for babies. We have pictures of the babies that were born as a result of it. You know, for the kids in the Cone Ice, we always do, I always have my photographer at all these events. So we have pictures of the previous year's events with, you know, 100 kids standing outside a Cone Ice truck with their, you know, cherry uh, milk shade or mustache on them. You know, it's that's the kind of stuff you're trying to do. Bring the community together become the neighborhood expert, give to the community, and I promise you they're going to reward you by you know, thinking you or at least giving you an at bat. And I know that it sounds crazy. What I tried to do when I went and first tried to replicate this in Yankee Trace 
uh, when we launched from Lock and Gren. Now, you, granted, Yankee Trace is 45 minutes away, uh, but it's another neighborhood that, that we live in. We're at the lake in the summer and over there in the winter. And, and I tried to do it. I tried to cheat. I tried to spin my way into it. You know, I was making a lot of money out of the other. So I was funding it with my real estate and I was just sending out postcards. I was doing all the right things, but I wasn't, I wasn't there. I wasn't putting the events on like I, I did in the other communities. They weren't having the opportunity. Or I wasn't having the opportunity to, you know, kneel down and, you know, and get one-on-one -on -one with the kids and say, Hey, are you enjoying your time here with the photographer at the, at the Halloween party? Yeah. Uh, that's another thing we do, not only the boot baskets, but for those of you that live in a neighborhood, we throw a tent out in the front yard, right at the street. We grill out hot dogs. We have a table. Now it's evolved into this big deal because every year I got to make it bigger and better. It's just my nature. But now it's evolved into a flat out party. But, you know, we were giving out hot dogs and giving, you know, little donuts from a local place. It was uh, donut holes and, um, you know, warm cider and coffee to the parents that were walking by just to kind of warm them up. And that was, and I was there, right? And that's where I think you guys just have to be present. So where I was going with that is you can't cheat. You gotta, you gotta, you gotta follow the plan, but you can't be not present. You gotta be boots on the ground or somebody in your organization has to be there to represent you and your brand. Yeah. 1500. Uh, a year, fifteen hundred. Well, you said the, the minimum is fifteen hundred. No, but how many? How many times a year you do postcards every month? Don't you? We try to do them something at least once a month. Sometimes you can skip if we're really heavy on, you know, events that month. Um, you know, promotional stuff that we can do online. But usually it's about once a month. Now, hey, Andrew. Another, okay. Yes. I was going to say one other thing real quick. One of the other things that's pretty effective in the neighborhoods if they have some type of newsletter in the neighborhood buy the biggest baddest space in at the back page the center page and then put list the homes that have sold even if they're not yours get the data from the mls and just post mls data sold and then have your picture at the bottom it just shows that you're an expert yeah i wanted to, uh, i wanted to, before we wrapped up for you just to give them a little bit of the info on how you uh, promote things with your blue cooler okay yes um, so Drew the Blue Cooler is uh, has got his identity of his own, and it uh, originally started out as being a closing gift for those people that bought waterfront homes. And um, it's a blue cooler. It was about that big, could fit maybe a 12-pack in it, sandwiches, whatever, and we would give them out to people that bought on the water. It had our logo on it. It basically just said Andrew Gatos and Associates, Lake Lock and Grand, or had our website. Um, everybody wanted a blue cooler. It was kind of a status symbol. How do I get a blue cooler? Well... I never thought about it. I didn't think you'd really want a cooler. But next thing you know, we started ordering these coolers and giving them out at every one of our closings. People were sending us pictures of them all over the country on vacations with these silly coolers that cost me 20 bucks. And they were ideal travel coolers. I mean, to the point where I've got a picture next to the Sphinx in Egypt with this cooler. And why it's great is that they, they travel so well. They fold up really flat. People can take them in their suitcase and then they can use them while they're there and then they bring their dirty clothes home in them or whatever they do. Well, um, so we created our own website, drew the blue cooler. It's got its own Facebook page. I'm sorry. And people just go on there and they post and it just kind of creates its own little community. But what happens is now when you go to an event in the community, you'll see literally 20, 30 of these blue coolers sitting around the floor because a lot of it's BYOB and you'll, you know, they have their name marked on the top of them. And now we've morphed to backpack coolers, which are phenomenal. I've got three of them in the car that I brought up today. Just we we're packing <laughs> stuff for the event and everybody's got a backpack cooler. So now you've got people that bought a few years ago are coming in and saying, how do I get the latest generation of the backpack cooler? So it becomes a little status symbol in the community. And at the same time, they're very useful. They're cheap. They're a great giveaway. And I would highly recommend uh, doing it. We give a cooler. We give a couple t-shirts in the cooler, a couple koozies, and then also we'll do a little, uh, uh, there's a flyer in the pocket that it gives them instructions on how they become part of our AGA VIP. And if they give a Zillow review and it gives them instructions how to give us a Zillow review, they're enrolled in our AGA VIP, which gets them access, like backstage pass access is how we promote it to some of our events, some special treatment, just another level of thanking people for helping us. We'll help them. No, no love and trust them. That's right. 
You got it. Yep. Anybody else have any questions for Andrew? I mean, he's uh, we're cutting into his cocktail hour. It's dangerous. No, no, you're good. You're good. I'm happy. <laughs> I'm just glad I made it. We were uh, the boys in the car were a little scared. I was driving a little fast up here. Yeah, we're cruising. Well, uh, I don't see any more questions in the in the comments, a Andrew. Um, this has been terrific. I, I still have the video that you did back in 19. I, I may put that together and send it out to everybody that that joined in in this, in this one as well. It's it's yeah. wonderful to all these pointers. Thank you so much. Well, anytime you guys need anything, reach out to me, private message me, whatever. I'd be happy to help. Just, guys, you have to believe in something, and you got to believe in yourself first, and you have to double down. And just because it's not working doesn't mean it won't work. It just means you haven't pivoted in the right position yet. And, you know, staying power is huge. I remember when Kender was talking about his first – uh, deal with with radio and I'm sorry with TV. He was in it like 60 grand before he actually started seeing the returns. He almost gave up on it, and next thing you know, the phone started ringing off the hook. That's a crazy example, but where I'm going with this is put the effort in. You know, it's two a days. It's the beginning preseason of football, and you're out there sweating your tail off, and you're like getting beat up, and you're you're hurt, and you, you don't want to go on. You know, there's going to be some glory at the end of it if you keep working, and that's what I say to my team. Make those deposits in people's lives. Don't ask for anything in return. Just be there and be ready when they're ready. They're going to call you. They're going to give you at least an at-bat. And when they give you an at-bat, Michael's going to tell you how to get it closed. You just got to get in the door. And become, becoming the neighborhood mayor is the first thing, in my opinion, the easiest low-lying fruit, the low-hanging fruit you can do. Just don't give up and keep pushing it. If you guys have any questions, reach out to me. I'm happy to help. Thanks. Thanks again, Andrew. Really appreciate it, brother. All right, guys. Say Have hey. Day. Hit all the honey badges. Hey, I will do. We're going to tear it up. All right. See you, buddy. Okay, we'll see you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.